So everyone, next speaker is Nathan Proctor. He's going to be doing a talk on what's it, right to repair and DMCA. So yeah, take it away. All right. So hey everybody, I'm, I'm Nathan Proctor. I'm a national campaign director with the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, and uh, I, I was just I was just having a conversation <laughs> with some folks and. Um, talking about how you know, it's a little bit intimidating for me to come in because I'm not an engineer, but I was just thinking, you know, I'm, I'm a social engineer. And I'm trying to think about what's happening in our society and how people can organize themselves uh, to deal with these problems. And that's why I care a lot about right to repair, um, because I feel that it's a, cr a critical way to challenge some things that are happening in our society. Um, that really do not work for people. And uh, I want to read this quote. So um, Representative Jeff Barker, a Democrat from Portland, says uh, under the headline, Oregon lawmakers want to help mom and pop shops repair your iPhone. They'll have to get past Apple first. Uh, no state legislature has successfully addressed the monopoly on tech repairs. So uh, Rep Barker says that he doesn't support the current version of the bill because he hopes backers can tailor a bill that doesn't go after the super secret information that industries have. So this is the super secret information, which I found by searching Google. This is a schematic from an iPhone. And it's, you can't possibly, you know, it's amazing how little information here is secret in any conceivable way. This is just an accurate, accurate measurements as to what the physical device is. It would help you create a replica it would not help you create an iPhone, but it helps you fix it. And the reason why we can get schematics for iPhones is because, as you can see, but the, this is a little bit old, but the kind of point holds that the last four iPhones are about 60% of the market. There's a couple other older iPhones that have a smaller chunk. But this is what the Android fragmentation looks like. <laughs> so, yeah, there's 5,000 different Android phones. So if you do not have schematics, if the manufacturer does not tell you specific and from technical information about the phone, and you go to repair it, you're, you're flying blind. Um, you know, and I like to say that this, if you think about what we tolerate for monopolized information with technology, the, you know, the, I, the Apple Watch is, is there on the right, your right, <laughs> and, or my right, your, anyway. Okay, okay, deal with me, people. <laughs> user error. And then uh, a regular analog watch is on the other side. <laughs> um, you know, you can, one of those is pretty complicated. One of them is just a battery and a few chips. Uh, the other, the other, the other way is uh, that they get in our way is these are, all, these are all screw, different screw configurations for different kind of screws we find and stuff. So some of them make a little sense and some of them are pretty silly. And you'll find this, you know, every time they make, they, they just make a, these uh, screw heads to make it difficult to open stuff. Another thing we're seeing is tiny, tiny little logos putting, put on all the different components inside the device. And the finger in this photo is uh, Jessa Jones, who is a, a micro soldering technician who does uh, board level repair for Apple products, and she's based in Rochester, New York. And uh, she, she took this picture to show after she had thousands of dollars worth of um, spare parts seized by border control. So when you ship um, recycled parts, so when, when we throw out our, our phones, they go to these recyclers and they take the phones apart and they take usable, valuable components and they use them to fix things. And that's good, right? That, that's a smart thing to do, except for Apple puts these tiny logos on everything, and if you don't black them out, then when they go to customs, Apple instructs customs to seize every one of those shipments because those are uh, counterfeit parts. Because Apple's not selling them. That's their definition of counterfeit. It doesn't matter if you're, it doesn't matter who, what the purpose is. I could literally take my phone, which has an aftermarket battery in it, because I switched it after battery gate, and ship it to China and back, and Apple would seize that phone at the port because it's a counterfeit Apple phone because it's not 100% within the Apple walls of their proprietary universe. So why is our stuff so hard to fix, right? We went through a couple of this. Can't get schematics. 
They, they put these ridiculous screw heads on there and they don't, they proprietary screws. They don't provide OEM spare parts and they block those parts at the ports of entry. They don't give us access to firmware updates. Um, and then, you know, they also have software that locks your phone uh, so that the dealers, only dealers can unlock. I actually have a, so right to repair is a lot of things, but one of the core things that right to repair is and is doing is trying to pass state laws that uh, require companies to give us access to five different parts of the devices that we own. Uh, one is the technical uh, schematics, the repair documentation, so that we can do all the maintenance, the, all the information for maintenance, that they would sell us on fair and reasonable terms, the OEM spare parts, or any kind of special screwdrivers that they felt the necessity of designing, um, that they would give us access to the diagnostic software uh, and, the, and the ability to, you know, update the firmware, to apply patches, to flash the, you know, the system to, to factory settings or whatever, whatever we want because it's, it's our device with our firmware. Okay, so all of that is on fair and reasonable terms, which for all the information is free and then for the parts and uh, tools is uh, the same price that they charge their own dealers. And that's what this law is that we're trying to pass in the states. Um, these are our values. <laughs> So this is, this is the uh, repair manifesto um, from iFixit. I think it's cool. I think you should download one and put it up in your workspace because it's cool. But yeah, we believe that repair is good and repair is empowering and it's part of the, the how we can democratize our technology because right now uh, we're seeing a, kind of a really scary consolidation of that. And so, you know, here's, here's another picture that I think sums this stuff up, which is used to be that people had control of their own technology and they would make choices like to fix it. And there were people that fixed those things and they learned a lot of great skills and then they, they might have taken those skills and then used those to innovate and create the next solution to, you know, kind of more and more, more and more better stuff. But now we have this other situation where we're losing all of our repair technicians and in our independent repair and we're creating a giant unconscionable amount of electronic waste, the largest, fastest growing waste stream in the world. It's 70% of the toxic heavy metals that are going into landfills are from electronic waste. And Americans throw out 416,000 smartphones every day. Um, and you think about all the useful technology that's in a smartphone. I have to say that like in Star Trek, they had five devices to do what a smartphone does. They just could not even imagine technology that's as useful as we've come up with but we just treat it as if it's disposable. I mean, those of you in free software can, can think probably of a hundred things with the computing power of a, of a smartphone to do with that technology, but you can't do anything with it because it's, it's, you're forced to throw it away given the way that they glue the battery in, given, given the way that they, they configure those devices. And so we are, we have a national coalition uh, to, to fight for rights repair. We're secretly mostly three people. Um, so it's myself and then um, Kyle Weens, the founder and CEO of iFixit, who is cool and, and, and awesome and, and it's fun to work with him. And then also uh, there's Repair.org, which is a coalition uh, organization headed by Gay Gordon Byrne, uh, who wanted to come today but sadly couldn't make it. So this is us. This is my network. So uh, U.S. Perk's part of the Public Interest Network. And so one of the reasons why we're able to move on so many fronts is we're in a lot of different states. As you can see, we're all over the place. Um, fighting uh, in so many places that I'm sure Apple's lobbying bills have become quite extensive. Um, there's also all, we have a bunch of other groups in the coalition with us, uh, all the cool people, a lot of uh, bo both businesses that work um, to try to maintain technology or recycle electronics, but then also groups like EFF um, who are kind of leading thinkers about copyright and things like that. And so. We're taking a step back, you know, right to repair is one of, the, one of the fronts is the state law. So this map is a little bit of a picture of um, all the different states that are active right now. There actually might be a couple more than are listed here. So, oh, there's, there's one in Vermont that's not on here um, that was introduced fairly recently. But we have bills in states that would require access to the five things that I said earlier, um, schematics, parts, diagnostics, firmware, special tools in all of these states. Um, and so we're spending a lot of time running around dealing with, uh, like our first slide, a representative, Jeff Barker from Portland, 
Oregon who thinks that a schematic is a top secret piece of information. Um, and it, the, the uh, kind of solution we have here comes from the fact that we have right to repair for automobiles, uh, which actually came from Massachusetts. So in 2012, Massachusetts voters um, voted like 87% to 13% to force auto manufacturers to release the repair and service information and software needed to maintain our cars so that people could have a choice of their own auto automobile technician. Uh, and yeah, because we want, it's obviously what people want is, their, is the choice of what to do with these cars. And they were making all these special proprietary diagnostic ports in cars. So another part of that law is actually change in engineering where they had to provide a standard port so that if you're an independent auto mechanic, you could plug in and you could read the codes, you know, which, uh, which is surprisingly a thing. And now we, there's a new bill in Massachusetts because auto manufacturers have found a loophole in the way the law was written um, by instead of having the software in the dealership, because that was the, the law is like it has to be the same for the dealership as it is for an independent, they, they have the dealership just hook up by Wi-Fi to the car, and they have a central computer for the OEM that runs all the codes, and because they don't have to provide any of that information to the dealership, then they don't have to provide it to the independents, which is crazy because if the internet goes out, then you can't fix your car anymore. Um, and it's crazy for like 45 other reasons, but it's just about monopoly control, and so there's a new bill now um, to, to kind of force them to stop doing that. But uh, after Massachusetts passed this bill, by 2014, this was a national agreement, and every state in this country, and, and any, any car is sold, you have the right to repair it, um, except for these new cars with these crazy Wi-Fi systems. But anyway, and then, so that's just state laws. So I, there's bigger problems with right to repair than just access to those five things, and that's why, that's where the kind of DMCA work comes in. And uh, you saw in that video that it's, it mentioned ex expressly that we're fighting for, we've been fighting for exemptions to section 1201 of the DMCA. So I should take a step back. I didn't even say what the DMCA, so DMCA is the worst law ever, as you know. And it's a law that was intended to stop people from pirating, you know, music and video games and movies. And they created a whole set of, um, these digital rights management systems, and also this, they created these crazy penalties for the circumvention of those systems. And pretty soon after that, companies started using their digital rights management systems to lock out all kinds of other usability of the device that goes way beyond playing of media. So why do they put the like anti-lock brake system in your car on the, in the same, behind the same DRM shield as the, wire, the Bluetooth music player, it's because they want to lock you out of as much as they can. They could easily design it so that the DRM shield only applies to the media, but <clears throat> they didn't do that. Because uh, they really want to, to, to con convey every line of code in that car as their special thought property, uh, and not as your physical property that is, in, you know, as a necessary functioning of the device that you paid for. So we've, gr and so that, we've been working really hard on fixing those problems with DMCA, but of course we probably also need to rewrite the DMCA and have a totally different regime when it comes to copyright. Um, and that is a longer project. So, um, and as, as you know, you know, the EU is currently voting on a really horrible copyright update written by manufacturers, essentially, which would uh, make it much more difficult to, you know, have, have anyone profit from, from digital media except for a, a handful of small companies. So we're not in a good place in the broader sense of the public on what it means to have copyright and, and what it means to work for us, um, which is why I think the right to repair battles are so critical because we've actually started to win people over to the idea that they actually own this thing. And we've pushed back on, on what the manufacturers are doing. Um, and then the, the third thing that we have been, that's part of the right to repair movement is the idea that we can fix a throwaway mentality. We, we, can, we can go from, you know, I, t um, Steve Jobs' vision for our computers was that it would be like a magic box that we wouldn't have any idea what was inside of it, and we would just behold its glory. 
and um, and he you know he he designed he designed with that kind of goal in mind. Um, but there's a consequence to us not having any power over the things that we need to run our economy and to, and to interact with the world. Um, and which is why I think we need to empower people to control the technology in their lives. And so this is a scene from a uh, Fix-It clinic, which is a free community event where people um, come together and fix, uh, fix stuff together uh, for free. And it's totally punk rock, and they fix lamps, and, and they, and they re-stitch jackets, but they also, uh, you know, fix computers and cell phones and all kinds of stuff. Um, there's a UK outfit called the Restart Project, which just focuses on electronics. Um, but yeah, we, we, we try to really push back on the idea that the technology is disposable, because we know that if it was designed properly, it could be used for a lot of different things for a long time. There's... A, we make a lot of new computing devices where we could just repurpose stuff that's already been built. Um, and so we've, we've made some cool progress. So I would say one, one thing that I wanted to highlight here was a, a huge win on 1201 exemptions in the DMCA. So basically, um, it talked a little bit about the, the farmers have an exemption now to hack their tractors as for necessary to repair. But basically, this last October, the, uh, the Librarian of Congress decided that basically you can hack anything that you own if, you know, it's yours. So, like, you, you can't, like, the, the, the purpose of the law was not to block you from having access to your cell phone or to your computer. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it's basically, you, DRM isn't, was being, they basically tried to tell the industry what they were doing was not consistent with the, with the law. And, uh, you know, it makes, a, it, it makes our argument a lot more sound. If the Copyright Office says it's not a violation of copyright to modify code in your own device, uh, it makes it harder for them to argue that that's the whole purpose of them setting up these devices where we can't touch them. You see that sticker? Anyone see, anyone see what that says? Oh, leg, font change. It used to say illegal. It looked really cool. That's too bad. It's a leg. The FTC, the FTC said that um, it's illegal to put void warranty stickers on things. Because in fact, the warranty is not voided when you fix it yourself. You have a right to do that. It's been baked into anti-monopoly uh, law from like, well, it's certainly in the 1975 Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, but it's been basically from the beginning. It's our stuff, we can fix it. They can't condition the warranties on us buying tie-in services from them. Uh, and, and now the FTC, I, I did this report, which you see there, 45 out of 50 electronics companies illegally void warranty sting operation. That's a little bit much for what we did. But we did a survey, and we found basically everyone does this. Everyone conditions warranties against independent repair, um, even though it's illegal to do so. Uh, and now the FTC has signaled a new fact-finding. So we're, we're working with some federal legislators to, or regulators to, to deal with that. Um, so anyway, I, I'm pretty much wrapping up here. There are th ways you can get involved. Um, you can check out repair.org if your state is one of those states with a bill. You should let your legislators know that you want it to pass. Um, you can, you know, oh, and, and this is one last thing I wanted to highlight, and then I'll take some questions. Um, SecureRepairs.org. So one of the things that, that manufacturers will come and do, and I can talk a little bit more about the crazy stuff they say in legislators around the country as reasons why we shouldn't, have ownership over the stuff that we buy. One of the things that they say is that it would really damage cybersecurity if we had access to ability to like, you know, patch our own firmware. Because that's like really dangerous, guys. I mean, I don't, I don't think you know um, just how complicated and scary this stuff is. And, uh, and, and it's amazing, the, these, the, the people they have to come in and testify have literally never opened anything or fixed anything. I mean, they claim that the diagnostic software that they provide to, like, diagnose an iPhone could give you access to all the user data. And, and I'm just like, okay. <laughs> Please bring an engineer from Apple in here and, have, and say this to them and watch them die because you've said that they've made the most awful security, it's possible. I mean, can, can you imagine if all 47,000 Apple employees could access any encrypted data just by plugging it into their diagnostic software to check the battery health? Anyway, 
they, they say crazy things. So we've created this group. Um, this is just led by this guy in, in Belmont here in, in Massachusetts named uh, Paul Roberts, who is the editor of the Security Ledger, which is an Internet of Things security website. And he's looking for people who know about cybersecurity to sign our kind of statement of principles that fixable stuff is secure. And we, you know, security by obscurity is, a, is an insane and ludicrous way to operate. Um, so yeah, so if, if you're interested in, in checking that out, if you, if you have a security background, um, but now I'm gonna pause there and we'll we'll take questions. So yeah, if you have questions, come down and line up. Um, you might be able to raise your hand if I can grab the other microphone, but for now, come on down and yeah, come down to the mic if you have questions. Talk. So you mentioned that uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi bill asked the manufacturers to release diagnostics, and uh, I presume if there's software that can fix your stuff, uh, that those software too. And I imagine those software will be proprietary, which means that if you want to fix your stuff, you have to render proprietary diagnostic software. What if it made more sense so that the law requires that manufacturers uh, give their users the ability to modify their software directly or to or somehow to expose how the, how the uh, diagnostic tools works instead of just releasing whatever proprietary software they decide to use. Thank you. Yeah, I... I I see what you're saying, and I wish the law could go a little bit farther towards, like, the vision of the world that, you know, is shared by a conference like Libra Planet to give us total control over the device software and hardware. Um, the idea of the bill is we know that they already have this software, and we know they already have these tools and parts, and they just have to give us access to it. So, but I, I mean, I agree with you that, like, it would be better if they gave us the, equipped us to actually maintain this stuff and modify it ourselves. And then with the DMCA rules that, that were released in October, you know, we clarified that we have a legal right to do whatever we want to the software, you know, within other, like you can't do something illegal with it, but if you wanted to modify it for another legal purpose, that that is your right. It's not easy to do, and manufacturers could make that easier, but um, I agree that that's something that, I wish we could accomplish that, but that's not currently kind of on the table. Good question. All right, this is going to be uh, quite similar, um, but it sounds like the right to repair uh, focuses highly on getting uh, equipment that works fine to begin with, but then breaks. Um, in my case, in uh, my current car, there are bugs in the software. Yeah. Um, in which, like, and in, in, in the freedom sense, it would be great to fix, but as you were talking about, it would be super complicated. Um, it's broken on arrival. I don't know if you have any uh, like coverage on that sort of, uh, sort of topic. Yeah, no, it's, we don't. I mean, I think we spend a lot of time trying to point that stuff out to lawmakers because, I mean, basically the manufacturers come into these offices and say, you know, we have these pristine products. They work perfectly. We, if somebody opens it and tries to do something, it's going to turn into a death machine. And uh, so, so literally, some lobbyists from the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers said that if we let people tinker with their washing machines, they would turn into death machines, right? Because what if the latch locking software was altered and the door popped open and your child put their arm in and was torn limb from limb and and it's just, yes, what if that happens? Also, what if I had to pay $900 to fix a $400 washing machine because you've monopolized the service of it? So I, I, I agree with you, and I think that part of what Rights Repair hopes to convince people is, is that you know, we're, we need to democratize the technology. We need to open up the maintenance of these things. 
the manufacturers don't have all the answers and that they, they need to work with us, the people in the world, maintaining the things that they create. And, and I hope that we get to more of that. Um, we got a question in from IRC. Um, next. And the question is, uh, how would one get started in component level repairs and what books and equipment can I get to get started? <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to read it. Component level repairs. Oh, okay. So like, so my cool friend Jessa Jones uh, does micro soldering. Uh, so to, to basically fix the do board level repairs on Apple products. And luckily, you have, there's this thing called the internet. And it tells you how to do There's somebody out there who can do it. And they'll tell you how to do it because people have this value of community over, uh, you know, competitiveness. The cool people do. And so, I mean, I would say, like, it depends on what you want to fix. I mean, the tinkering resources out there. I love Jess's uh, YouTube channel. To, to talk about micro soldering and board level repairs for, for Apple products. I think it's totally awesome. But there's a lot of people out there, um, and you should, you should check it out. Yeah. Uh, kind of along a similar line, is it, um, is it legal to, it, would it be legal to produce something like a Wikipedia of stuff where you kind of agglomerate all the repair manuals together? And have people tried to do that before? So you, 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 you are describing the greatest website on earth yeah. called I Fix It. Yeah. Okay. It's the open source manual for everything. So you can literally fix like your jewelry or your Jeep Wrangler or your iPhone 6. It's it's kind of amazing. They 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 have more than 50,000 different products that they have repair manuals for now. All right. Great. Yeah. It's a good plug. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out and uh, I thought your talk was fantastic. Uh, I thought particularly interesting the part about how manufacturers have basically done an end run around the will of the people established already in right to repair laws. And I think it really points out the fact that, you know, the real problem here is that capital markets, if we resolve, if we expect that capital markets are going to resolve our problems, are clearly hopelessly broken and are not actually funding innovation. So there's sort of like various attempts to work around that with. Uh, we funder or things like that. Are, are you aware of anything like seriously trying to free up manufacturing capital for people who actually want to manufacture things and not run intellectual property businesses? I wish I knew. I wish I had a, a good example for that. No, I, I I agree with you that like building, you know, people who innovate technology with the value that. It should be like they, they're contributing to the world and not trying to take a piece of it that they can monopolize and, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know of such a, a platform, but I'm like, I'm enthusiastic about someone making one. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the talk. It's if people haven't heard this, this is really good news to get out there. <laughs> um, this is about the Massachusetts right to repair in 2012. And the thing that struck me about that is how lopsided it is, 87% or something. And it's either Massachusetts is the home of all the auto mechanics of the nation, or it's one of those general subjects that people just get it about, perhaps about ownership, perhaps about recycling, and that kind of thing. Um, and I was curious if during your research, if you figured out how that made it to the ballot versus being handled just legislatively. Yeah. Because I feel if that, if the question went to basically any state, people are going, whether they're a technician or not, are going, well, you bought it, it's yours, duh. So I was wondering if you knew how that made it, because I could Yeah, that's a, I, it's a very insightful question. <coughs> um, I think that, you know, this kind of goes back to my kind of opening where I said, like, you know, I'm a social engineer. And the reason why I'm working on right to repair is I think because it does make sense to people. And it's just, it becomes immediate, like, the thing that we're trying to express, they immediately internalize. Like, oh, that's right, like how I can't fix my phone, and I throw the force me to get a new one. Oh, that, that begin to, like, it's an entryway into the, the creating systems that give the democratization of our technology. Um, so I, I think I love that part of, of your point. And then specifically on how it worked in Massachusetts, um, you know, 
it got to the ballot because the, the proponents, you know, gathered 120,000 signatures, which is very time consuming and very expensive. And it didn't pass the legislature because the auto dealerships put a lot of money into lobbying and the auto manufacturers. But really, the, the dealerships care more about it than the manufacturers because the dealerships are the ones who benefit from the monopolized service of the cars. And so we see this a lot, like, um, like with uh, John Deere. Like, John Deere designs these incredible monopoly, this incredible monopoly lockouts for their thing, their tractors. But the dealers are the ones who like are terrified that we're going to break those monopolies open, and they will not have the they will not be able to use the monopoly system to guarantee their own business. That terrifies them. Um, so th that's the political reality: is there's just a ton of money coming against us, and you know, it's going to, but once pe if the people, like the voters, were actually, say, hey, do you think that you should have monopolistic repair systems or everyone should have access to whoever they want to hire to fix anything that they want? They, like, they're going to choose the latter. But the, I mean, in order to actually get it in front of, I mean, the legislature, Massachusetts, which has a ballot system, they put up a lot of barriers to make it incredibly hard to put things in the ballot because they do not want people to vote on what they really want. I mean, it's, it, we, democracy overall needs a little bit of a boost. We need to kind of get back to controlling things in the commons and our repair and our voting and a lot of other stuff and, and our software. Um, and I think that that's a value that we as Americans need to kind of really build towards. Because uh, I think it'll solve a lot of the problems that we have, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, and especially as someone who's organized in politics for a long time, I can tell you, there's, it's hard to find a problem where there's not also uh, an opponent that's a vested special interest that's somehow blocking an 80% public interest issue from moving forward because they can capture the political system with money. Okay, one, and then I think we're out of time, but. So the question is, let me read. Uh, thanks for the speech. Um, will laws that force right to repair uh, on companies prevent companies from making smaller and smaller high-tech products? Does it stunt innovation? Um, I'm going to go with no. Um, c companies make a lot of stuff that is impossible to fix. And no one has the expectation to fix it. So when you get a phone from Samsung and you find out that it's basically just completely, the cavity is completely filled with glue. And that if you go to uh, authorized Samsung repair, they have a $30,000 machine that heats it up and slowly opens it because it's a glue-filled monstrosity. And you need a $30,000 machine to open it, right? So that, would, that makes the maintenance of that phone a lot more expensive, right? So if people had the expectation that things could be fixed, and then they took it in. They're like, oh, how do I open my Samsung Galaxy 9? They're like, oh, you need this $30,000 proprietary machine. I think that that I mean, would begin to create consumer forces that would force people to actually engineer stuff that's more durable. So that, that's one problem is that they, it's not that they're making these super small gadgets and, and, and therefore they put no engineering expertise into making them fixable. They're just rushing stuff to market without really kind of innovating sustainably. And this would force, I would think, some consumer uh, pressure on them to innovate more sustainably. So I mean, I, and, and maybe it, it will change what innovations come. And it, 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 I hopefully will make them innovate the sustainability because we're gonna, my children are not gonna have smartphones unless we stop having a 18 month guaranteed to die electronics in, in 2019 because we're just, the components, the rare earth metals, will be so incredibly expensive because we'll have used up all the rare earth metals on, on the planet, and the only ones who will be able to have a cell phone will be like the military or you know the the billionaires because we've consumed all of this stuff with this disposable electronics that are made artificially disposable. That's what I think about that. <laughs> all right, <laughs> thank you all. That was awesome. Honored to be here.
right, so yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you, Nathan. Um, so yeah, it's lunch time now. So if you want to go head out, get some lunch, and come back for the next round of talks after that, that's a great time. So yeah, cheers. <laughs>